So our research um, is titled Black Girls Matter, Exploring the Lives of Black Middle School Girls Who Have Faced School Disciplinary Actions. So I just wanted to provide a little context of how did this study come about. Um, Vita and I are very passionate <laughs> about supporting black youth. So a lot of our work that we have done and we're still continuing to do centers around um, supporting the academic and social emotional um, development of black youth. So maybe two or three years ago I had an opportunity to do a presentation that focused um, on my work that I did with black girls in Georgia and at that presentation it was um, someone who came up and was like, oh I'm working in this program with students who have been expelled and you need to come out and kind of help and work with them. So my trusty colleague, sister, scholar, friend, um, <laughs> Theta, I said, you want to do this opportunity um, with me? So that particular program was called a PALS program and it's in Columbus and basically students who are suspended, they instead of going home, being sent home, they're sent there for three to five days um, and they do academic work, but then also it's a very supportive social emotional environment as well. So we started volunteering there and we realized that three to five days really wasn't enough for any type of rehabilitation and sustain, to see sustained difference with those particular students. So we said, we really need to do something um, maybe in the school, on a school site, that would be through the entire academic year. Of course, as professors, that takes money <laughs> to do that. So we decided to apply for a Spencer grant and this research is supported um, through our research with Spencer, or our Spencer grants. So, yeah. Lisa. Okay, so as Lisa just said, we started to think about, you know, well, what can we do within one school? So Lisa will talk a little bit more about this later, but we work in one middle school um, in Columbus. And the idea is that we work with them once a week um, with our middle school girls once a week. And we talk about self-esteem, leadership skills, and give them coping strategies and different topics that Lisa will cover a little bit later. But if we backtrack and think about, well, why are we doing this? Why black girls? Why black middle school girls? Why black seventh and eighth grade girls? If we look at the statistics, the statistics are extremely disturbing. So nationally, um, according to multiple trusted resources, we keep coming back to these disturbing statistics. So, um, which state that black girls are six times more likely than white girls to be suspended. For black boys, they're three times more likely than white boys to be suspended. And some of the conversations that we hear are, well, maybe they're doing something that's categorically different than other students, um, and that's why they're getting in trouble, which is problematic thinking in the first place. But what is actually happening, what studies, what national studies are showing, what statewide studies are showing, what school district level studies are showing is that for the same actions, these inequitable practices or disciplinary actions are happening. So that um, sort of, it squashes this notion that they're doing something different, right? So all things are the same, their actions are the same. Sometimes it's the same teachers um, who are essentially categorizing or saying that this is what will happen to you. So if we think about the study significance, there are many scholars who have continued to engage in this work, which is really important. Um, particularly black women scholars who are also upset by these staggering statistics and not just because they're statistics because we realize that these are actual bodies. These are bodies and these are students, you know, for whom, for us as teacher educators, we are embracing them and we are thinking about all the potential that they have, yet these statistics is really squashing their potential for academic success. So uh, scholars such as Crenshaw, Ocean, and Nanda 
talk about these disconcerting statistics and that there is limited empirical evidence. So there are limited studies that actually say we are concerned with what is happening in their lives. We're concerned with their perspectives. We're concerned with their parents' perspectives, their teachers' perspectives, school administrators' perspectives. And then furthermore, if we think about this particular time in their development to be in middle school, Right? This has significant implications on their life outcomes. And we'll talk about some of the ways that they have been pulled away from the classroom when they're continue, continuously suspended and out of the classroom. So just a little bit about our study. It's currently ongoing. So this isn't a, we've done a complete, first of all, we haven't finished collecting data. Um, so therefore, we haven't done a complete data analysis um, of our research. But we were asked to share, so we are a team <laughs> of players, so we will share. Um, so we had four research questions that guided our research. One, what are the school and home experiences of black girls that have been suspended? And how do these experiences shape their school performance? Um, we really want to focus not just on looking at school, but holistically. Like, what's happening in both spaces? I think a lot of research either focus on one or the other. Um, so we want to get a more comprehensive look at what was happening. Um, what are teachers and administrators' perceptions of black girls who have been suspended? A lot of times you hear deficit um, narratives about uh, this particular student population. So we want to kind of capture what were teachers and administrators who have a pitiful role in creating the school organization and structure. Um, perceptions, what are the teachers and administrators' experiences with working with black girls who have been suspended? And then how does a weekly in school um, social and emotional support group for black girls who have been suspended shape their school performance? So again, we want to kind of get the experience aspect of it. And then we also want to look at maybe what might be a possible intervention um, through a weekly girls forum that would help kind of support these students. So our research theoretically, we are informed by critical race feminism, which is an out, um, outgrowth of critical race theory. And the reason why we really wanted to use critical race feminism, I think we embody um, theoretically critical race feminism, but also because it pays attention especially to the lives and the stories of black girls. And more from an asset base um, than a deficit base, which a lot of research does um, focus on. And it gives voice and shares their narratives and then also, importantly, counter narratives as well. Um, so we use critical ethnographic methods to grind our work. Again, we're inside the schools um, at least once or twice a week. We're also within their community context as well. Um, so we wanted to use ethnographic methods, but then also looking at that critical aspect that's looking at critiquing the status quo and looking at notions of power as well. So methodologically, that ground our study. So thinking about our data source, we have interviews. We have student interviews. We have interviews with um, the teachers and then also interviews with the girls' parents. Specifically, most of our interviews have been with a guardian. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about that as well. Observations, so we go into the classrooms and kind of observe what's happening in those spaces and then also thinking about um, our work in the weekly forums as well. We do journal entries. We also collect writing samples. Um, we do goal setting activities with the girls and then also student surveys have been um, given out. And then also looking at school performance data, so progress reports and report cards and then students' disciplinary records. And we're lucky that we have their disciplinary records, not just for the year that we're working with them, but back into elementary school. So we can see what are some patterns that have been developed and what are also some narratives, because the um, disciplinary records are interesting because it's not just this student was suspended, but it'll say why this student <laughs> was suspended. And um, we haven't really done a content analysis of that work, but I think that would be really interesting because, again, this deficit narrative and the notions of what students are being suspended for, is it worthy to be suspended for some of the things of, she talked back to me. 
yes, that's problematic, but is suspension the right form of disciplinary action to coincide with that particular thing? Um, so our weekly girls forum structure, we have a 45 or 40 to 50 minute um, session depending on how transitioning between classes work. We know elementary school. <laughs> you could lose a lot of time in that transition. Uh, um, we're working with eight students, four seventh graders and four eighth grade students. And then it's two sessions, so we do a four, uh, eighth grade session and also a seventh grade session. Right now we have six girls, because one unfortunately was expelled from school, and another one um, just transferred to a new school as well. And then topics that are discussed in our weekly forum include academic success, leadership, um, positive identity development, college career preparation, critical awareness, um, coping with tough situations, and then also looking at social issues. And then other things that we've done with the girls, we brought them to OU. So we want to include campus visits. So OU, a PWI, we also plan on taking them to Central State, uh, HBCU as well. Um, we are going to go to the Freedom Center um, in Cincinnati as well. So we're also embedding trips to kind of expose them outside of their own, um, own local environment as well. So, one of the things that we struggle with as scholars who um, is doing this work is this notion of mm, problematic discourses. So these are girls who have been suspended. So we're not saying that um, their experiences are, it's not, so we're, it's hard to share some of the stories without thinking about systematic issues of oppression and how everything that we do is housed in that notion. So when we look at a parent who doesn't come up to school, instead of saying that parent just doesn't really care, think about what are some reasons why this parent might not come up to school. They might not come up to school because they might work. <laughs> Employment, economic stability is important. So. If I don't come to this work and I'm docked pay, or I might lose my job, then right now that becomes a little bit more important than showing up to this school. Or, unfortunately, maybe that particular parent didn't have a positive experience in school. So they don't see schools as this, as this resource, as this positive um, space to support their youth. They just think about the negative experiences that they have as well. So there are a couple of discourses so pushing back against the pathology of black parents, um, parents with limited financial resources and their children is one of them. Refusing to describe black students through their pain and perceived um, deficiencies. And then also acknowledging the existence of multiple systemic actors as well. Um, not just this student, this parent, and even this teacher. Because um, we're gonna talk about problematic things about teachers as well. And I think we have to highlight those, but then also realize that there are plenty of good teachers um, as well. So again, these are prelim preliminary findings. So what we're gonna do is kind of pick, we pick two students, and we're just gonna share about two different narratives about for each student. Uh, one that kind of looks at maybe home or personal life, and then the other one that looks at school. So Leela is the first um, student that we're going to spotlight. She's a charismatic seventh grader uh, who aspires to be a fashion designer, not fashion designer, sometimes teacher, depending on the day you get. <laughs> so she might be a fashion Easter, College of Education. <laughs> probably is a good spot from her because she's probably get a dual degree in fashion and then teacher ed as well. Um, so I might have to speak that into her ear a little bit. Um, she's a biracial student and identifies as black. Her grandmother has custody of her and she's currently staying with her mother and father with nine other people in that household. So just unpacking that a little bit, she's biracial. Her biological mother and her biological mother, her mother is white and her father is black. Um, but her grandmother technically has custody of her. When we first started working with her, she was living at grandma's house, and then somewhere, maybe around December, she started living back home, even though her grandmother still has custody 
of her. And one of the reasons, or one of the things that we had this conversation about, because it also coincided, I think, with um, her acting out a little bit more when she went and um, lived back with her mom and dad. And we had this conversation of, don't you think it might be better to kind of live at home with grandma? Uh, you know, you have um, a little more structure at grandma's house, and she acknowledged. She said, yes, that's the case, but I know that if I'm at my grandmother's and I call my mother, sometimes she won't answer the phone. But if I'm at my mom's house, I get to see her every day. So you have youth making these adult types of decisions about where they want to live. Um, and then also another thing about this particular student is that she has a speech impediment. Um, and we use intentionally the word misaddressed in it because um, we think that she probably could receive a little more support with her um, speech impediment. And she also is very self-conscious of it. So she's aware of it, she's mentioned it as, um, as well. So that's a little bit of context about her. So one classroom experience that we wanted to share is that, um, so one day she was sitting at her desk in her classroom. She planned to do her work as directed, but when she called for the teacher's help, she recounted that she was ignored by the teacher. She put her head down on the desk. The teacher responded in the front of the class. There goes Leela being a loser. So that's extremely problematic. Uh, thinking of a space that's supposed to be supportive of you. And in this particular case, she was gonna do her work. So I, I just wanna backtrack a little bit. It's not to say Leela, she goes and, and does her work. She has tension with this teacher. So part of it is teacher's frustration of not knowing how to deal with um, students who need extra support, but then in no case is it okay for a teacher to call a student um, a loser. And for this particular student, she's one of the students who definitely, if you sit next to her to do her work, she will do her work but she needs redirection several times to engage in her work. And one of the things that she has mentioned to us on several occasions is that in elementary school, she didn't have behavior problems like she has now. But when she came to sixth grade, she kind of felt like she had teachers who wouldn't help her. So she definitely needs a lot of support, academic support, um, to complete her work. But when she asked for help, she felt that she didn't receive her help. So she's using her own agency to be defiant in multiple spaces. So she gets in arguments with teachers. But if you're a student and you're sitting in a space, let's say 40 minutes, and I'm sitting there and I have no clue what's happening, you could do multiple things. You could sit there and have no clue, or you could be frustrated and show your frustrations and acting up. And I think a lot of times that's what she engaged in. But when you have that, in conjunction with a teacher that's really problematic as well, you have these cases of, instead of supporting and realizing what's wrong in this situation, of I'm frustrated so I'm gonna act up and call you a loser, which is extremely problematic. So another um, story I want to share with her, or about Leela, is also thinking about this home, um, home life. Because one of the things I've had the opportunity to observe this teacher, and he thinks he's sarcastic. <laughs> so a lot of things he feels he's saying out of sarcasm, but again, sarcasm, seventh grader, and cause and loser, I don't think it's really sarcastic in that context as well. But one of the things he mentioned was like, yeah, I called home and grandma's not helpful. And um, as part of the interview process, we also interviewed grandma. So I had a conversation with her and she's also frustrated. She's equally frustrated, but sometimes you don't, know, you don't know how to maneuver the system. It takes a certain capital to be able to figure out, first of all, have the confidence to come into the space, and then also having the knowledge of how do I advocate for my youth? How do I advocate for my child? So one of the things that we definitely spoke about was speech, and she said, I don't understand why she's not getting speech. Sometimes I don't understand what she's saying and I'm her grandmother. So if I don't understand what she's saying, then 
I know her in this world is, is going to be problematic. Um, and I would say my sister colleague friend, Theta, is very a proactive person. So she kind of went and figured out how can this particular student, Lala, get speech. And one of the things is this, the system is kind of convoluted. It's, it's like you have to fill out this paperwork and you have to do this and you have to do that. So it's a lot of hurdles that we put in place for parents sometimes to receive the support that their youth need as well. So thinking about these different structures that are existing that um, that prevents parents from advocating in ways that they should. One is just knowledge. Another one is the system that's preventing um, certain aspects as well. So that's just a little bit about this one. Okay, so a second student that we will introduce you to um, and share as much about her as we can. So Essence. Essence, Essence is an outgoing eighth grader. She's a black student who absolutely loves to write. So whenever we're engaging in creative writing activities, she's all on it. She's usually the first one who is finished when she is writing. She started off the year doing fairly well academically. To give you more context about what is happening to her, she entered the foster care system because of abuse at home. Within a year, she ended up being shuffled between two foster care homes. For those of you who are familiar with foster care, you can also go to respite sometimes on the weekend. She has been to respite a countless number of times in that year as well. So she's continuously experiencing shifts. Currently, she doesn't feel supported at her foster care and it is beginning to impact her grade. So now we are seeing a decline from the first quarter to the second quarter and third quarter. And she can pinpoint that on her own if she is asked and her engagement with her peers. So she started off the year, she's one of our students who did not get into fights, and she could really self-direct herself. So the moments when she felt like there were things going on that were distracting to her, she would remove herself and go to the principal's office and sit outside of the principal's office to do her work. So she was choosing on her own to stay away from what she perceived as drama. Never mind that some of the labels that were placed on her were, oh, this may not be a student, and this is not by the administration. This is just by when she's in the, in the foster care system, she was kicked out of maybe two schools already. The previous school has made comments about um, her being unruly or able um, to work effectively in certain spaces. So these are the things that we've heard and we've had to trouble through. So if we think about this survey, we did a survey with our students and asked them certain questions about how they feel about their identity, how they feel about school, how they feel about what's going on in life. And one of the statements was simply, my life matters. For Essence, we didn't get a chance to talk through her exact response. Unprompted, when the session was over, she said, Ms. Lisa and Ms. Theta, do you want to know why I put the answer that I put? And what she did is there was a Likert scale, strongly, dis strongly agree to strongly disagree. She put that she strongly disagreed that her life did not matter. She said, if you want to know why I put that, it's because if my life mattered, all of these bad things would not keep happening to me. I wouldn't keep having these very negative experiences. So what she is telling us is she is struggling with what is happening with her in foster care. She is struggling with what has been happening to her in school, and in just a moment, the next slide will give you more of an idea of what has happened. Now, I want to make sure to make a disclaimer. Um, this disciplinary record is not from the current school that we're working in. It is from a previous school, and she would have been in seventh grade at this point um, of her disciplinary record. So in, um, in middle school still. You can't see this very well, but I will read it to you. So um, this basically says the duration of her being expelled from school is 12 days out of school. So this is a part of her disciplinary record. The student, Essence, admitted that she brought a knife to school. She stated that she's afraid of a man who lives near her bus stop, question mark, after she stated it. She said that she had not informed the teacher of the situation. The teacher will speak with safety and security to occasionally visit the bus stop to ensure that Essence and the other students 
at her stop feel safe. However, you still get this 12 day suspension. Mind you, there was a knife in her backpack. She did not brandish the knife. She did not threaten anybody with the knife. She mentioned that the knife was in her backpack in a non-threatening way. It was not used against a student or a teacher. But when asked, she told the truth and said, I have this knife in my backpack because I'm afraid when I get off my bus stop. Question mark, which means I'm questioning her voice. I'm questioning her narrative. I'm telling you that I have it because I feel insecure, but a question mark goes in the records. These records are very telling. And occasionally, when we get the chance to, we will check it out and see if it's an issue. So let's move on. Here is another nine day school suspension. This time, guess what? You get a nine day suspension, OSS is out of school suspension without homework. We didn't even know that such a thing existed that you could get suspended from school and it's up to the school's discretion to decide whether or not we send you home with homework or not. So it means nine days is essentially two weeks of school. You're at home for two weeks. We will not give you work. Even if it's requested, you sit at home as a punishment. For her, during the 2016 year, so from January 2016 to April 2016, she was suspended out of school for a total documented. Her documented suspensions were 33 days. Oh my God. 33 days means that in the, for, from January to May, that was an entire month. Well, let's, if we're counting five days, mm -hmm. right? Uh, mm -hmm. More than a month, right? A month and a half of school, that she was out of school. So let's think about this. Are you learning? What are you learning? What is happening to you at home? Where are you? Which leads us to a series of questions that we will ask in a little bit in terms of, does this make sense? Is this really the remedy to what is happening? And the other times that she has been suspended, if we look at her, rec her records, say things like insubordination. What does insubordination mean? And sometimes it means I'm cursing at the teacher, I talk back. And sometimes that means, well, I curse at you, I didn't listen to what you told me to do, which I shouldn't have done as a student, but because of that, I get suspended and kicked out because of that. So we think about what this means for us, and it means that discourses and actions necessarily have to shift, right? So that there should be agency that is fostered among students. So one of the comments, and we see this happening too, one of the comments was, student thinks that she can ask the teacher questions. Student thinks that she can challenge the teacher by asking questions. But isn't education about us training or supporting students and helping them to become critical thinkers. To become a critical thinker, you need to ask a question. So the teacher just said, challenge the teacher, ask the question. Agency needs to be fostered among all of our students because among some students, it is valued that they ask questions and that they're critical thinkers. Affirming youth voice, this question mark next to Essence's voice, it silences her voice and her experience. It needs to be affirmed, and it doesn't harm us to assume that this is the case. It doesn't harm us to believe that this is her story. Believe her first, affirm her voice. Meeting basic needs, she has basic needs that are not being met, and some of our students don't have basic needs, needs that are being met too, which connects back to a comment that Lisa made. And we're saying we're not blaming any one person or any one group, but we're saying Students sometimes don't have their needs met at school. They don't have needs met at home. They don't have needs met in the community. When all of these things converge together, it is very difficult for them to navigate and journey through life. We say all the time, as adults, we're not sure how we would deal with some of the things that they deal with as grown adults. So to expect a middle school student to deal with moving and um, being taken away from your home, being kicked out of a classroom, being called names, being talked about, all of these things on a regular basis are very damaging. Embracing belongingness, again, this idea of calling a student a loser is anti 
making them feel like they belong in a classroom space, nurturing a sense of value. They should know that they are valued, that they can make mistakes, and that certain things won't happen to them if they make mistakes, and that we deal with trauma. So several of our colleagues who are here in the Patton College talk about this idea of trauma and why it's really important for in school for us to think about how are teachers to respond, how are teachers responding to what is happening to them, and how are school disciplinary actions responding to the trauma that is happening to them as well. So these are some critical questions that we thought about. And we specifically thought about them because if you look, if you go through the school to prison pipeline literature, you, there are many scholars who say that there's this pipeline that exists. Some say it's a metaphor, right? Other scholars say, well, there actually is no correlation. There's nothing that says in the research that if you get suspended more in school that you are more likely to end up in the criminal justice system. What we are saying is, no matter what that evidence shows, we know and we are experiencing how black girls are overrepresented among students who are suspended from school. Let's take Essence, 33 days away from school, it questions whether or not you are going to pass that grade. If you are continuously held back, you're not in school, do you end up going to high school? Do you graduate from high school? If you graduate from high school or don't, what happens to you after that? So we're just saying, what happens to their life outcomes? Even if it's not that they end up in prison, they are being criminalized. It's a criminal system that criminalizes young people at times for behavior that happens during this time. So here are these questions. What are patterns of school disciplinary actions and school suspensions? Do schools and school districts and states care about what their records show? Do they go through the records to see what the patterns are? Who is overrepresented? So we know that nationally, black students, then Latino students, then Native American students represent the three highest racial groups of students who are suspended. We also know that emerging bilinguals, students who are LGBTQ youth, students who are on IEPs are also more likely to be suspended again for some of the same actions that other students who aren't suspended have. What are they disciplined for? How subjective is this process? Um, Insubordination is a very subjective idea to me, right? So there are some teachers who say, you walked out of class when you weren't supposed to, you were being insubordinate. You gave students answers to a test, you were being insubordinate, you deserve to be kicked out. There need to be some harsh repercussions for what you did. Does student behavior match school disciplinary actions? We're not saying that some of these behaviors are not problematic, but what has happened to a school system where we criminalize the behavior as opposed to restoring students and helping them out and figuring out how do we keep them inside of the classroom? And then really, do increased school disciplinary actions improve individual and overall academic success or climate of a school? Nationally, studies are showing no that the more you suspend, the more you have disproportionate disciplinary records. It doesn't mean that overall your students in your school are performing well. It actually says something about the climate of your school. So what does that mean? If what we're doing is not working and it's actually harming individual and overall students in a space, we need to critique and actually move on what is happening in these spaces. There are some power imbalances that Lisa and I see all the time and we debate about these philosophies inside of the classroom. And sometimes some people will say, well, these are old school philosophies. Sometimes old school philosophies don't work, right? And sometimes new school philosophies don't work, but we need to think about regardless of the philosophy, is it harming our students? Who is it harming? And I'll give you an example. This idea of, and many of us have probably heard this, respect isn't given, it's earned. When you walk into my classroom, you will respect me, no matter how I respect you. We're saying that there's necessarily going to be a power imbalance if you already may have an inherent bias against your students that you are aware or not aware of, and then you have this belief that respect is earned, and that when you walk into the classroom as a student, you respect me as the teacher, 
that is sending a message that said it's dehumanizing because a humanizing way of thinking about respect means that both of us as humans will respect each other. You come into this space and I respect you. Right? So I, I, I expect this reciprocal idea of respect. Kids can pick up on if you're not respecting them and you don't care about their well-being. That is a recipe for them checking out and, and not wanting to be in that classroom space and then doing whatever to get out of that space. Zero tolerance policies. So over the past few years, these zero tolerance policies have increased thinking that if we crack down on students and let them know that we don't have tolerance for these certain behaviors, that this will work. Well, dress code policies. Really, dress code policies tend to turn into policing students' bodies and how they present themselves in a classroom space. So we think about this idea of um, what does it matter if you have a hoodie on in class, but it is a part of many nationwide disciplinary um, disciplinary policies. If you violate it, you can get kicked out of class for a number of times if you keep coming to school with a hoodie on. Sub subjective insubordination that I just talked about a few slides ago. No lip gloss policy. So one of our students was kicked out of her classroom because she put lip gloss. This was a new classroom for her. She put lip gloss on. The teacher told her to put her lip gloss up. She said why. The teacher kicked her out. So one, this idea of that lip gloss is disruptive to other people. <laughs> Two, the idea that if you ask why, that if you ask why to the teacher, regardless of your tone, that that is categorized as insubordination and you get kicked out of the classroom, as opposed to using it as a teachable moment or saying, actually, we can talk after class. Out of school suspensions lasting 30 days or more. There are suspensions where you can be in middle school and get suspended at one time for more than 30 days. So think about how that makes sense. That is necessarily creating a particular trajectory for this student who is already vulnerable in so many other ways. So what we're saying is we don't think these questions are being asked enough, and it's not just the questions, it's are we analyzing the answers and are we responding to the answers? What we are calling for as teacher educators, so again, we know that there are many systems involved, but because we're teacher educators, what we're calling for is, for, for part of this, is restorative teacher education. So what if for that teacher who called his student a loser, or the teachers who are kicking students out for things that they shouldn't, what if during their teacher training they were trained in a different way? Or the professional development that they received on a regular basis in that schools let them know that that was not okay and also gave them the tools if indeed they didn't have the tools to engage in restoring. So restorative teacher education is helping our teachers to maintain students and keep them inside schools and inside of the classrooms. But in order to do this, we have to backtrack a bit because it means that we need to do some, um, we need to historicize what is happening. This is, this is about race. It is about class. It is about gender. So we have to name and critique racism. We have to name and critique all other injustices that are converging and happening at the same time and end up manifesting themselves inside of our classrooms and in our students' lives. So again, this is talking about in our classes and in professional developments, we do have to confront race and privilege. We do also have to think about teachers' own personal narratives. So what did they hear and experience when they grew up? What are their beliefs outside of the classroom about students who look like them or don't look like them? It would be very negligent of, of us to believe that if we have these inherent and long-lasting thoughts that they do not seep out and impact our students, even if we don't, we're not conscious of it. So, and then to think about teaching philosophies and practices. Right, so we also have to think about what does it mean? So we think about young women, black young women who we've seen in um, the media, and we were just talking with Dr. World Randolph about there are these videos that have been recycled of a black young woman being body slammed who was in a body suit, uh, um, a swimsuit. Um, a black young woman in South Carolina, Columbia, South Carolina, who was body slammed in her chair 
because the teacher asked her to put her cell phone up and she wouldn't. But the idea is really, if yes, a student is in some ways not responding to you or some teachers would say being defiant, but does it really require that if that student is being defined that you have to call the school resource officer? How about just let that student sit there? If they're not disrupting anybody else and then you talk to them after class, that is all about you feeling or us feeling disrespected. This child is not going to sit here and not respond and do something that I told them to do. Something very damaging happened to that student and she will never forget being body slammed by a man that was three times her size. And as a result of that, she was suspended from school. So her behavior was criminalized. A non-criminal behavior was criminalized and she was traumatized as a result of that. So we have to think about all these things and backtrack to, well, what is it that we can do as teacher educators? So part of this is thinking about our school spaces and what our school spaces should be that unfortunately often aren't. So schools as a healing space. So again, a lot of our students, unfortunately, um, have a lot of traumatic experiences. So, but if you ask some of the teachers about the backgrounds of their students, they have no idea what's going on in their lives. And I get the notion of having um, privacy, but outside of all of that, it should be a place of healing, a place of support, instead of a hostile environment. I think a lot of our students that we're working with, our girls, would say school is a hostile, uh, a hostile space. Mm -hmm. So how do we transform that to a healing space? How do we make a school a place of refuge? How do we have schools as promoters of black excellence as well, of showing, particularly in teacher education, when most teachers are predominantly white teachers as well. So then how do we still embed that narrative of you're great, black excellence is a thing, um, and sharing those particular discourses with our students. Systems of support as well, some examples that we think are important is to listen and respond to black girls' lives. When we're constantly shutting down students' voice, we're definitely not listening to them. So creating a space where they have an opportunity to share and whose voices are being shared. I can tell you in that one particular class where that student was called a loser, our um, school site is racially diverse. It's probably about 40% black, maybe 40% white as well. Um, but in that particular class, I can tell you most of the students who are talking are white students in that classroom. Um, so who's having an opportunity to kind of share in those spaces? Providing in and out of school counseling that's relevant and effective as well. So again, thinking about students with trauma, how do we support them? Um, creating an, um, an enact humanizing school engagement policy. So instead of zero tolerance policies where regardless of context, and this is the problem with zero tolerance policies, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter why you bought that knife in. It doesn't matter why you might have, um, you just might have had a bad day and you act out. It doesn't matter. Context doesn't matter with zero tolerance policies. It's just, you did this, this is your punishment. So we need to kind of critique what's happening with these policies that we have in schools. Training, sustain, training sustained teachers in adopting ethics of care, which um, Lita talked about a little bit as well. Economic education and health empowerment for families and communities. Unfortunately, again, when you look at the disparities, it's racial, but it's also socioeconomic as well. So how do we surprise support for all of our families that, um, so they don't have to worry about other things um, that's impacting the way that they interact in schools and support their students as well. And then also ensuring that students um, most of the need have additional resources that are plentiful rather than scarce. So making sure that you have speech pathologists at school. Um, so students who have speech impediments or um, students who need other additional types of supports and services, they can get that in school. Um, which also helps parents try to maneuver the system 
outside of school if resources are provided within school. And then we also kind of want to lead, we kind of talked about some of the, the problematic issues in schools or in this particular school, but there are also good things happening in this space. And that's what makes it complex, because society is complex. So you'll have a space that has positive things, but then also problematic things. And the goal really is to critique those problematic things and try to erase that and kind of um, highlight, enhance some of the positive things that are going on. So school administration that embraces outside resources and programs to support students' academic and social success. They did not have to let us come into this school to do this research. The reason why they wanted us in this school is because they realized they had students who needed extra support. So our presence is a space or them acknowledging some of the issues that they have and saying, we need all the help we can get. So if you want to provide some help, yes. But thinking about what are some other resources can, that can go into schools, teachers who are committed to working with students outside of class and who check with, in, with them regularly. So we have student, I mean, teachers who give up their lunch period. We have one academic program called the, um, Cadre. the Cadres. And so for that particular program, <clears throat> the teacher is recognizing students need support. So they come in during lunchtime and she provides academic assistance for them. So doing more of that within schools. School counselors who extend themselves to connect students to supportive resources and develop academic success plans. In that particular school, they have an awesome counselor um, who's really engaged, but one counselor with all those students is a heavy, a heavy load. So finding out how do I support this sixth grade student, but then also as a counselor, you're also doing high school applications as well. So you have all the eighth grade high school applications and then you have what's going on in seventh grade and you have what's going on in sixth grade. So regardless of how great of a counselor you are, it's very taxing to give the support that you need in that space. And then principals who create their own student groups to support um, students uh, most in need. So one of the cool things that this principal does is she looks at their academic reports. Students who are failing, she has one-on-one -on -one meetings with those students to have a conversation. Um, and then also, she just recently um, implemented a new strategy because she's trying to increase parent um, involvement in schools. She has the students to write letters to their parents that she mails out and say, I would love for you to come out to school and um, meet with my teachers. After she has, the principal herself has conversations with those students. So just knowing someone is there and invested in you and invested in your success and your growth, um, doing more of that, particularly from a leadership, which is hard, because as administrators, you have a lot of things that you're, that you're fighting against as well, a lot of duties. She was doing budgets yesterday um, when we were there. So, but administrators who take the time to show that they care and they're invested in their students' lives as well. So, that's just a little bit of the work that we're doing. Um, we're looking forward to continue. We won't be finished until June, um, basically, but we wanted to share some of the things that we're seeing and experiencing, and then some of our thoughts about what might be the direction to go to help support the students that we've been with, so. Thank you. Thank you. I see the pizza did arrive, so you all know for you to take some. I'm sorry it was late. No, yeah. okay. If you have any questions, feel free to, to Questions ask. or comments, we, we welcome them, certainly. So I saw Tamron and then Arish. So thank you so much, because as I'm listening, I'm also training diagnosis and treatment right now with my counselor, so I'm able to take it's not just oppositional defiant. Please let's think deeper about what's going on with our students in our schools. Um, just wondering, uh, hope for you to be able to follow up with these girls as they enter and, and do some longitudinal, longitudinal work to see how your intervention is Thank you, and we want to. We think about that all the time. So we think about beyond, um, and Lisa mentioned this earlier, that you know we are very thankful on a number of different levels to do this. So um, Tammy Solomon helped to connect us to this space. We're very thankful to her. And we also received a, a Spencer grant for this, and this has helped us to do a tremendous amount. And we're thinking about, but next year, when there is no Spencer grant, 
What does that mean in terms of our time? We're very much committed to them because we have worked far out, far beyond the hours that we budgeted for three and four times, sometimes more. So we think about what does this mean for us? And we've also started to reach out to um, black women undergraduate students who are here and at OSU who could potentially continue this mentorship, right? Because they're the students at OSU are closer to them. So we're thinking, well, what if they created they continued this and created their own forms of mentorship. So we are next week actually piloting and seeing how it works to match several of them up with um, undergraduate students here from OU and students yeah. from OSU to see if we can get the ball rolling in that way too. Yeah. Okay, um, Arij and then Shauna. Okay. So um, it is really disturbing what's happening to students in classrooms. So I, last week, there was a Muslim student here at Athens, actually, one of the, I mean, Athens High School. She was sitting in class. She didn't know, she didn't want anybody to know she was Muslim. She doesn't wear hijab or anything. And the teacher in the social study class said that, you know, he talked about 9-11 and the Muslims and how bad they are and that no one wants to know them or get along with them because they, they don't help themselves out. <laughs> and so she sent a text to her mom and she said, make sure nobody knows that we are Muslims because they don't like us. And her mom talked to the teacher and you know, the teacher was really understanding. He said, well, I didn't know. So if you knew, you, I, maybe you wouldn't I would have said hide it. it. Yeah, I wouldn't have said it then. Yeah. I would have said it in a different way yeah. or made sure you weren't in the classroom when I said so it. So it's really descriptive. You know, it's just, um, mm -hmm. and the students just didn't want to go to school again. She said she doesn't want to because now people know that she's Muslim and they won't talk to her. But the teacher said he's going to talk to students and change those stereotypes. And going, okay, well, hopefully that will happen. So we're now actually looking at the understanding of parents' perception about those teachers. Are they really prepared mm -hmm. for what students who are culturally and linguistically diverse? Mm -hmm. yes. And it's just happening a lot if you don't fit the, what they know from their background. Middle class white teacher, they don't really know anybody who's different, some of them, not mm -hmm. all of them. So how can we really help them? So we're looking at the teacher preparation programs. Mm -hmm. Do we really do enough to prepare our students mm -hmm. before they become teachers in actual classrooms? Mm -hmm. And I think um, we have a really big role here to play I think, mm -hmm. before they graduate. So Thank you for sharing that, Arisha. And I'm sorry, you know, it, it, sadden, it saddens us every time we hear these, we hear them or we see them because we've observed <laughs> some of these things happening. And often we think, we would think that maybe some teachers' behavior would be different if they knew an adult in the room was in the room. But it's telling when the behavior yeah. doesn't change and we still see I some of these things that classroom, happening. That means, that, that means you don't really believe it. You're just saying it because I'm there. It still uh -huh. doesn't yeah. really help your case as a teacher who's yeah. fighting stereotypes. Yeah. So we teach about diversity, but do we really prepare our students for diverse classrooms? Uh -huh. You know, we teach about it in our content maybe uh -huh. once in the entire semester, but are we really preparing those students? We think about, and then another question is, you know, some people say, well, I'm entitled to my beliefs. I'm entitled to respond how, how I respond. Well, maybe it doesn't mean that you, of the life of a child, you should not go into a profession where if you are just resistant to changing, because we do want to work with all of our teachers, regardless of their race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, for all of us to be critical at any point, because it doesn't mean that we, we've arrived, that we will arrive at one day and we can say we are completely socioculturally conscious, right? It's an ongoing process, but just also to think about for some of the teachers, some of the responses have been where the, the teachers union is so strong that it's very hard for this particular teacher to be removed from the classroom or for much to change about his behavior. So even those policies, thinking about that's beyond teacher education, but that's a policy about what behavior is okay for teachers to stay inside the classroom. Sean? My question was, uh, what strategies or mechanisms you use in terms of when you would have been observing some of the behavior, reading the files, or so on? How do you regroup and deal with that? A lot of conversation. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, Shauna, that's a great question and debate. Yeah, we did have a big debate yesterday. Yesterday. <laughs> yesterday. So it's, it's sort of like 
after every session, we sit and for the duration of that session or more, for 40 minutes or more, we are debating and talking to each other about what just happened and what it means for us. Yeah, we typically go to lunch at the end, of, like after, it's after lunch hours, but maybe around three o'clock or so at that day and kind of debrief and have conversations. And we also bring it to colleagues here at OU who we know are passionate about that same type of work. And it's like, Adrian, counseling, tell me <laughs> what do we well, do? what's going on. So using your resources um, as well, particularly in an interdisciplinary way, because this work is truly interdisciplinary work of how do you support, because human life is interdisciplinary. So finding <coughs> all of those entities who you know are knowledgeable or at least passionate and supportive of that to have these conversations about what do we do? Because we do leave that space in like, what are we going to do? <laughs> what are we going to do? How, how are we going to deal with that? Or when we hear maybe something, maybe a teacher yell or something, it's like, what do we do? And then, I mean, there's a lot of conversations we have too just about research mm -hmm. and knowing that we are guests within this space. So how do we critique the system? Where do we draw the line of researcher versus human beings who are passionate and want to support these young adolescents as, as well, dealing with those, those dilemmas? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, a lot of conversation just happens and as well. We often leave with heavy, with heavy hearts. So we often have to figure out what, what do we do with that because we know that immediately in that day, there may not be anything that we can do for immediate change, right? So we have one of our students who we love. She is so funny. Um, she and Lisa joke all the time and I think they have a particularly strong relationship. She feels like our, our space is a safe space and like she can communicate with Lisa. Some of them communicate with us outside of school. But for her, it seems that she is being transitioned out of school. Um, as amazing as she is, as wonderful as she is, she is an eighth grade student who is 16. She has been held back two times. If she gets held back a third time, she will be an eighth grade student who is 17. Which, according to them, can't happen anyway. Right, but, so they are thinking. But she's failing, so mm -hmm. if nothing's happening, like, it will be more social promotion than anything else. So Shauna, for us, we think about her and we're like, what needs to change in her life? And we can think of all these things that need to change, but immediately they are not going to change. So for us, I know, so for those of you who are parents, for those of us who are teachers, we always have this statement and say, we can plant the seed, maybe we'll see it grow years later, but you know it can be hard sometimes if you don't see it immediately, you wonder, you know, is this being effective? What impact is it having? Um, on students when we know that systemically there are so many other things that need to happen. Inside her house she has a tremendous amount happening. She's experienced um, traumatic deaths in her family one after the other um, which she's skipping school. She's she's experienced abuse. She's experienced abuse. Not from her parents. Well um, not that we're aware but from other entities. So, so she has completely checked out. Completely checked out of school being a space that she sees her. She has desires to become a nurse, nurse practitioner mm -hmm. and to graduate eighth grade, but there's a disconnect. All of these things are so heavy in her life that even when we provide coping strategies, they work for a limited amount of time, but it, it's just not enough. So yet, so for us and our expertise, yes, we often, you know, come to our colleagues in counseling or ask Adrian, well, what do you think we could what strategies can we give this student when they are, when there's this particular situation? So it, it has been fulfilling work for us, but at the same time, it, it is very hard, extremely hard. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much for your great presentation. In one of your slides, you showed this, um, I would say, suspension papers, and you referred to the language mm -hmm. and how you the question mark, and since those are documentations, they're so important to change the whole narrative. Mm -hmm. Just out of curiosity, and Dr. Harrison said about the interdisciplinary nature of this research, is there any place in your final report to address the language of those papers 
and a critical discourse analysis of with regard to the, to, to the whole story or not. Yeah, so actually part of, in our Spencer grant, part of what we said is we already, we were forward thinking about this and said we will use critical discourse analysis, not just for their interviews, but to also look at the school disciplinary records. So we were intentional about saying, can we get the records? And we're really thankful to the administration because like Lisa said, they went all the way back to elementary school. So we have an opportunity to see the comments and some of these comments, they're just, it's just amazing to see um, what she has thinks been she's written. grown. It, <laughs> as a comment, she, she thinks, thinks she's grown. grown. She thinks she's cute. Yeah, she thinks she's cute. Um, she talked back to the teacher. She gets you know suspension. Or what happens if she thinks she's grown? She thinks she's cute. That gets said back and forth with the teacher. Student may curse. Student may say something. Then it becomes you get suspended because you were being insubordinate. You cursed at the teacher. So it just. <laughs> yeah, we need to train teachers to be more reflective in their own practice. <laughs> of like, instead of saying, is the child, is the parent, to think about how are my own actions um, embedded in this scenario. Your question also makes us think about, so just recently, um, several of us were connected with um, educational attorneys who are doing Legal Aid Society, Legal Aid Society actually in, in Athens. So they're looking at rural um, disparities, and these same disparities are even worse in rural areas. But what we are thinking about is legally, they let us know, like, legally there are certain things that can't be done. So why you mentioned me say that Essence had been, there were 33 days of documented suspensions is that what actually happens is sometimes students are sent home and it's not documented in their records. So this is what gets documented. Essence also had a hundred day. She was out for a hundred days. Mm -hmm. So again, and then you wonder why academically she's behind when you've been out for a hundred days. Right. She said she had work, but she said sometimes she didn't do the work because there's no one to check in to make sure you, that you're doing why you're doing that work. Mm -hmm. so. so legally there are certain ramifications, but then there are certain things that you can get around in the system by again not documenting the number of days or so the more that we are learning, it's helping us also to start to advocate for school and district based disciplinary policy change because some of these things just absolutely don't don't make sense. And part of it is parents, they don't know their rights. So, cause we're teacher educators and we were like, wow, like we didn't know that. We didn't know that for the young lady who was recently, she was expelled. What happened was she got, now she was our most academically promising student. She was doing um, extremely well. She did, she did, I think she was struggling with self-esteem and identity issues, so she will often um, start disagreements with her peers, but we, we feel like it's rooted in something. She got into an altercation with a peer. In the midst of the altercation, the dean of students came in to break it up. Not on purpose, but the dean of students ended up on the floor. Her head hit a locker on the floor, and it was just because she was breaking up the fight. No one pushed her. It just happened because they were fighting each other. Because of that, and they were tired of the student, um, the police came, they actually sat her in the back of their wagon, and she The other girl up, was handcuffed. The other girl was handcuffed, and uh, her, her, feet, her feet were shackled oh, yeah. in her uh, eighth grade. Oh, eighth grade. Um, they put her in the back of the police car. She was eventually expelled. What we did it, so we did know that there are these things called hearings where your parents are there and there's a hearing authority who looks at the videotape, decides what happens. So the hearing authority looked at the videotape, decided that it was grounds for her to be expelled. She did get expelled. What we didn't know is that, that, and what, that we don't think this happened. We don't know if the parent knew that she had rights to a lawyer being at that hearing and that because of their socioeconomic status, a lawyer could have been provided to them. Mm -hmm. And the women who we talked to said that there hasn't been a case that they have turned down. So it wouldn't have been a case of where she would have called and they would have said, no, we can't go, we don't have anybody to send. 
that that didn't happen. So maybe in that case, okay, you know, if that was ground for, grounds for her being expelled. But how many times are there hearings, unfair hearings that happen when parents or guardians do not know that they have access to an attorney who can advocate for them? And the other thing they said, uh, those particular lawyers mentioned is that a lot of times these hearings is three days after the incident. So it doesn't provide enough time to seek legal advice. Mm -hmm to have representation because the, the turnaround is just so quick. Um, so I get if the student's out of school, you don't want to have a long time between your hearing to hear it, but you also need to be able, or a parent needs to be able to find legal resources to kind of help to represent. Mm -hmm. And so part of it is finding resources in the community that can educate parents. Because inherently, not to say that a school doesn't want to provide a parent with an educational lawyer, but that kind of goes against <laughs> the school. So finding other resources within the community to share some of that information so parents know their rights as well. So, any other questions? I have a wish, not a question. No. <laughs> just, I wish we would just change those zero tolerance policies to actually safe zone where students are allowed to make mistakes and then we correct it in the classroom mm -hmm. and we like we try once twice three times to tell that actually and like you were mentioning why are our students behaving the way they are there is a reason behind it mm -hmm. at home or a school or a peer in the classroom i don't think kids are just evil by nature mm -hmm. but their behavior has to come from sources mm -hmm. and i think we should look at that so caring enough about the, the young lady who was body slammed in South Carolina, I forgot to say this, her mother recently died. Her mother had recently died and she was being shifted, I think, back and forth to different homes. So to me, she was managing quite well if the only thing that she did was hold on to her cell phone when she was asked not to put it up. So in thinking in those ways, or, or do we give our students coping strategies? So one of our students, she actually cursed at the teacher, uh, the cursed at the principal when she was talking to her because she felt like the principal normally had been an advocate, but in that moment wasn't listening. Basically what happened is one of her peers said, they got into an altercation, she's very sensitive about her grandmother's passing. Her peer said, F you and your dead grandmother. So to a middle school student who in that moment she was trying to resolve the situation and then she said, you know what, all bets were off <laughs> at that point. So then she started cursing. The principal intervenes. She said the principal wasn't listening. She was trying to tell her, well, what if somebody said that about, and the principal said, well, I don't, I'm not interested in hearing that. Sometimes some of the things that we do, um, and, and we don't know that it necessarily is shutting a student down, in that moment she cursed at the principal. What she needed, what she was advocating for was space. So we said, what about next time if you just said, you know what, um, Miss So-and-so, I'm really upset. Can you just give me, can you give me a minute? Can you just like let me sit outside? Can we talk about this later? Because I'm really upset. And she could even say, I might curse at you, but and I don't want to. Can you give me a minute? We're not modeling that. We're not giving those resources to our students to say, it's okay for you to be upset in that moment. But there are different ways that you can, that I can help you handle it. So, well, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much.